Good afternoon, and welcome to the Copyright Office presents The Enduring Legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm Jaylene Johnson, an attorney advisor with the Office of Public Information and Education, and I'll be serving as your host and moderator for the day. While Justice Ginsburg is well known for her work on issues of gender equality and women's rights, she's also had a great influence on many other areas of law. Today, we'll focus on her impact on copyright law by discussing some of Justice Ginsburg's copyright-related jurisprudence to see how her judicial opinions have helped to shape the law. But influential judicial opinions aren't Justice Ginsburg's only connection to copyright. Just before the start of the program, you may have been able to view a presentation showing photographs, drawings, book covers, and other works featuring Justice Ginsburg. Many of these works are creative works that are protected by copyright and whose owners graciously granted us permission to include them in today's event. Inspiring authors to create is just another way that Justice Ginsburg has made a huge and lasting impact on copyright. And later today, we'll discuss some of those creative works and Justice Ginsburg's influence on those works. But before these conversations with our panelists, to start us off, I'd like to welcome Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you, Jalen, and good afternoon. I appreciate that all of you can join us virtually for this special event. Today, we are celebrating the enduring legacy of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg was a hero in every sense who fought for equality and justice with grace and persistence. And this afternoon, we will remember a gentle but unyielding spirit who inspired us to question the barriers to justice for all. Her lasting impact on this nation is immeasurable. Her influences on the law, human rights, and even pop culture are felt every day across this nation. I have 
a wonderful mass that says, never underestimate the power of a girl with a book. Justice Ginsburg was a frequent guest here at the Library of Congress. Whether it was discussing her children's book in our Young Reader Center or talking about this book, my own words, during the National Book Festival, where thousands of people, many young women or mothers with their daughters, lined up for hours, some starting at 4 a.m. I had the honor of talking to her backstage that day, and I told her, someone told me you were like the Beyonce of jurisprudence. And her response to me was, I prefer J-Lo. She embraced her popularity with her nickname, the notorious RBG, but most importantly, she embraced and supported the arts. She was no stranger at the Kennedy Center during concerts of the National Symphony, Symphony, and she was a lover of opera. A beautiful opera was composed and written about her and Justice Anton Scalia. And you can read excerpts from the opera in her book. Justice Ginsburg was a prolific writer. The Library of Congress is honored and proud to have her papers as part of our collection. She started donating her papers to the library five years after being appointed by President Bill Clinton to the Supreme Court. For more than two decades, the Manuscript Division has been honored to work with the Justice and her staff to gather, preserve, and process these invaluable resources. Her words and legacy will live on here at the library. Thank you again for joining us today, and I look forward to the discussion. Back to you, Jalen. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Next, please join me in welcoming Register of Copyrights, Shira Perlmutter. Thank you, Jalen. And thank you all for joining us to celebrate the remarkable copyright legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg was an extraordinary leader and an inspiration in the legal world and made a tremendous mark on the country through her work as an advocate, a teacher, and a judge. Numerous tributes have been paid to her brilliance and her eloquence and her moral compass. Many of these tributes have focused on her decades of fighting for gender equality, from her first Supreme Court argument in Frontiero versus Richardson, where she persuaded an all-male court that women in the Air Force had an equal right to the housing allowance provided to men to her majority opinion in United States versus Virginia that enabled women to attend an all-male military academy. She steadily and persistently pushed the law in the direction of equal treatment. But our focus today, as Jalen said, is on another area of the law where Justice Ginsburg had an outsized influence. And of course, that is copyright. During her time on the bench, she authored over a dozen majority opinions concurrences, and dissents on copyright matters. They covered a wide range of topics, including the extension of the copyright term in Eldred v. Ashcroft, the restoration of copyright in foreign public domain works in Golan v. Holder, and the constraints of contracts on publishers' ability to use the works of freelance authors in New York Times v. Tassini. These decisions were milestones for the copyright system and provided clarity to both owners and users of works of authorship. In her opinions, Justice Ginsburg consistently identified the constitutional goal of copyright to promote progress and spur creation and publication of new expression. She stressed that the creation of new works is surely an essential means to advance the spread of knowledge and learning. You will hear more about her copyright jurisprudence shortly from professors Jane Ginsburg and Paul Goldstein. But writing opinions was not the only way in which Justice Ginsburg had an impact on copyright and creativity. She inspired the creation of many works of music, books, art, and film, one of which will be featured in today's program. Some of the artworks were even incorporated into consumer products like mugs and pens and t-shirts in addition to the mask that Dr. Hayden showed you. Justice Ginsburg has also been the subject of a museum exhibit highlighting her influence and her achievements. Most of all, she had a deep appreciation and love for the arts and for artists. 
As you heard from Dr. Hayden, she was particularly devoted to opera, which she said totally carried her away because she was overwhelmed by the beauty. As you'll hear about more later, her friendship with Justice Scalia, who shared that devotion, uh, inspired an opera itself, Scalia Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg even performed in an opera a few years ago with a small but show-stopping speaking part in Donizetti's The Daughter of the Regiment, which I was lucky enough to see. She exercised her formidable writing skills by editing her lines with the result that was characterized by the director, and I completely agree, uh, as very, very funny. Given all of these connections to copyright, it is truly fitting for the Copyright Office to celebrate Justice Ginsburg. Today's event will explore her perspectives on copyright law, as well as the creativity that followed from her achievements. We are honored to host it and look forward to continuing to be inspired both today and in the future by her legacy. Thank you, Shira. Now I would like to invite Professors Jane Ginsburg and Paul Goldstein to the virtual stage. Professor Ginsburg serves as the Jankwell Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia Law School. And she is also the daughter of Justice Ginsburg. Professor Goldstein is the Lewis Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Both are renowned and globally recognized intellectual property experts, scholars, and authors. Professors Ginsburg and Goldstein will take a look at some of Justice Ginsburg's copyright-related jurisprudence and examine some of the ways in which Justice Ginsburg helped to shape the law. You may read more about each of our speakers in the bio links that have been provided in the chat. Thank you, Jalen. Uh, Jane, great to see you. Wonderful to have this opportunity to talk with you about uh, Justice Ginsburg's copyright uh, opinions. Uh, like you, I've had uh, the opportunity over the years to read all of her, uh, all of her copyright opinions more than once and some feature uh, in, uh, in my teaching, uh, certainly. But what I really liked about this opportunity was the, the chance to read all of the opinions together uh, to see what, if anything, I could uh, could be discovered uh, about uh, Justice Ginsburg's copyright jurisprudence. Did she have a, a copyright uh, jurisprudence? What I found, uh, and I'd love to hear your reflections on this, if you, you agree or, or disagree, uh, was a profound regard for the workings of, of copyright, not just copyright doctrine and reconciling one, one decision with, with another decision, but the workings of copyright in the, in the market for goods and in the political economy, uh, the workings of copyright uh, in the United States, domestic copyright, and, and copyright abroad. And tying it all together, uh, if there's a single thread, uh, and it's actually more <laughs> like a steel cable uh, than it is a, uh, a thread, is a profound commitment to judicial restraint uh, in copyright lawmaking. Uh, a respect for, cop for, for Congress as the, the dominating force uh, to be followed in the design of our Copyright Act. Does that ring any bells for you? Uh, well, first of all, let, let me uh, thank the organizers of this event for uh, asking us and for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about big ideas in copyright with Paul Goldstein. And uh, I certainly agree that uh, a respect for U.S. institutions and also international institutions informs her copyright jurisprudence, as it informs, I think, her uh, overall uh, oeuvre from uh, from the bench. 
uh, we'll probably talk about this in more detail when we get to the Eldred case, but that's one that very much illustrates the uh, boundaries of the respective roles of courts and Congress, because that's one in which she concludes the majority opinion, saying that this might have been a bad law, but not every bad law is unconstitutional. And it's not for the court to substitute uh, a policy that some might find more enlightened, notwithstanding Congress's poor judgment. Yeah, I picked out that uh, passage in which she uh, she talks about the wisdom uh, of the copyright term extension for when we talk about that. And it's interesting that we uh, both focus in on on that uh, version of, of judicial restraint. Uh, to look at a more recent opinion, in fact, her, her final opinion uh, in, in the area of, of copyright, uh, the lesson I get is that her deference to Congress in, in copyright was not a reflexive exercise of judicial restraint, but the product of a really careful understanding of the proper roles of Congress and, and the courts generally. And this is the only copyright opinion. Uh, this is the Georgia against public resource uh, .org decision in, uh, just last year. Uh, the, the, the point of, uh, of the decision was to describe what the roles of Congress and the courts, what the roles of legislatures and the courts what those roles are and to derive a copyright result from that. The, uh, the Supreme Court uh, held in, uh, in the Georgia and public resource uh, case that just as the Supreme Court has historically withheld copyright from the opinions uh, of judges, uh, not only the opinions, but their annotations and their interpretations of what they did uh, so copyright should be withheld from legislative annotations, uh, characterizations by, in this case, a state legislature of what uh, the law is and uh, how, it's been, how it's been developed. Uh, the, there was a certain logic to, to the court's uh, decision, a logic that Justice Ginsburg quickly uh, dispatched uh, in her dissent. And she said, there's a difference between what it is judges do and what it is legislatures do. Uh, judges do interpret the law. And as a consequence, we should be withholding copyright from those interpretations and annotations. By, by contrast, uh, legislatures do not interpret the law. They make the law. Their role is to uh, to make the law rather than to annotate it. And there was no good reason, uh, certainly in the long line of judicial authority to withhold copyright uh, from uh, legislative annotations. Uh, it was a nice little exercise in political science uh, as, as a grace note to an important copyright uh, opinion. Thoughts? Um I, I agree entirely. I, I see it really as an opinion about the nature of the judicial function compared with the nature of the legislative function and really only incidentally a copyright opinion since there's a copyright consequence to uh, determining what is the nature of those two functions. Of course, this only concerns state materials. We wouldn't even have to get into this for uh, federal uh, materials because they would all be works of the United States government. The uh, PRO against Georgia case comes about because Congress determined not to exclude the works of state governments from copyright in the nice clean way that Congress did for works of the federal government, thereby uh, putting courts in the position of trying to sort out uh, what kind of output uh, the uh, government employee produced work is. 
Uh, I think it's also noteworthy that uh, Justice Breyer joined her in the dissent in the PRO against Georgia case. Uh, they were not always aligned in copyright cases, but this may be further evidence that this case uh, is more about uh, the institutions than it is specifically about copyright. I think that's, that's right. I hadn't thought of it that way. It was certainly unusual to see uh, Justice Breyer signing on with, uh, although he did it before with Justice Ginsburg uh, in an important copyright uh, case uh, like, like this, there, at the same time, this judicial restraint and deference to, to Congress did not exclude uh, judicial lawmaking. Uh, there are areas, as we know, uh, in the copyright law that Congress has left exclusively uh, to judicial lawmaking. Uh, the, the standards to be applied, uh, the originality standard, the work needs to be original to be protected by copyright. It needs to be expressive rather than, than just an idea. And it was interesting to look at how Justice Ginsburg dealt with lawmaking when that became the proper province of, uh, of the court. And for that, I moved to the opposite end, the opposite pole of, of the timeline uh, from her last copyright opinion to her first copyright opinions uh, when she was sitting as a judge uh, in the uh, DC circuit. And her very first copyright opinions were uh, the uh, Atari against Oman, uh, the uh, video game maker against the Oman, Ralph Oman, then the register of copyrights. This, these were in 1989 and 1992, uh, where the question was, was the, had the Copyright Office acted correctly uh, in, in rejecting uh, the copyright applications of Atari in its video games? Uh, by the second opinion, uh, the office had made clear that its reason for rejecting uh, this was the, the games was their lack of sufficient originality. Uh, and Justice Ginsburg referred to a opinion of the United States Supreme Court in the Feist case uh, that obviously she had not uh, been, been part of, which set the standard of originality very low. Uh, and uh, said, no, you know, you've got it wrong. This is the standard of originality and we have to defer to no one but the Supreme Court on that uh, and don't even have to defer. Uh, Shira, I, uh, I nod in your direction. We don't even have to defer to the, uh, to the register of, of copyrights. Uh, the, the other case where uh, she was wrote a concurring uh, opinion is of particular fascination, Jane, to you and me. We have uh, spent I don't know many I don't know how many hours uh, debating the question of copyright for works of industrial design. A copyright is there copyright in can there be copyright in, in useful articles? Congress has spoken on the subject, but left uh, an important area untouched and it has caused division among courts. I think there are probably six different tests. What, for, for viewers, uh, what I'm talking about is the design of a very elegant chair, let's say an Aeron chair or an Ames chair uh, which has an elegant design, uh, sometimes gorgeous, uh, but also is a useful article and copyright is not supposed to protect useful articles. How do you draw the line? Uh, the, the test, which has been applied in dozens of different ways, uh, is so-called conceptual uh, separability. And the court, Supreme Court thought that it had for the first time since 1954 in front of it, uh, a case to uh, put its stamp on, to draw together these diverging uh, theories among the circuit courts to put its stamp on what conceptual separability 
was the the subject matter in uh, in issue there uh, were designs, graphic designs placed on cheerleader uniforms. In fact, for those of you who were watching the slideshow before uh, this event uh, began, uh, there was a color uh, slide of some of those designs from the appendix uh, to the uh, to the opinion. Uh, the uh, is a rule that hard cases make bad law. This is a case where an easy case might have made bad law, and I think that was so in uh, Justice Ginsburg's opinion. Uh, the court looked at these two-dimensional designs and developed from that a rule on conceptual separability that I think is going to have a hard time being sustained when applied to three-dimensional objects like the, the Aeron chair. And I could sense in reading the very terse uh, opinion, uh, concurring opinion of, uh, of Justice Ginsburg, it was just, I think it was four, pack, four short paragraphs long, her frustration that when, a case, when the court finally took a case dealing with useful articles, uh, or it, so it thought, uh, it should take one that could not generate because it wasn't a hard case, like a three-dimensional chair could not generate a sensible rule, particularly, and this is the judicial restraint point, when there was language in the statute that disposed of this simple case. I'm gonna quote the uh, first paragraph uh, in which she says, I concur in the court's judgment, but not in its opinion. Unlike the majority, I would not take up in this case the separability test. Consideration of that test is unwarranted because the designs at issue are not designs of useful articles. Instead, the designs are themselves copyrightable, pictorial, or graphic works reproduced on useful articles. And there were three more paragraphs, but that said it all. Uh, Jane, any thoughts? Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, Star Athletica was not the right case to uh, try to uh, interpret the separability standard, precisely for the reasons that, that you give. Uh, and I'm not sure that there's anything in Star Athletica that's really going to help us when we try to uh, apply the court's current test to a three-dimensional uh, artistically designed useful article. The, you, you said that, that uh, Congress had spoken. Um, well, yes, but in a fashion that is so incoherent that I think there's a, a lot of work for courts to do, courts uh, and, and commentators. I might point out that one of the most helpful comments uh, on uh, separability was written uh, several years ago, uh, more than several years ago, uh, by Shira Perlmutter when she was still an academic trying to make sense out of the separability standard. And I, I don't think that anybody has done a better job at, at that since. Uh, so I suppose that the area of uh, copyright protection for the artistic designs of useful articles is one where there is uh, a lot of room for judicial development, given uh, Congress's failure to speak clearly in that instance. With respect to the uh, Atari cases, I think it might help to remind people what those cases involved. I don't know how many people remember or even heard of a video game called Breakout, which was uh, by today's standards, it's extraordinarily rudimentary. Uh, it was maybe one step up from Pong uh, and a step behind Pac-Man for people who remember these, these things. But it consisted of a, a highly schematic drawing of a brick wall, the bricks being represented by rectangles. And then the player had a paddle and the idea was to uh, hit the ball in a way that would cause the bricks to come down and ultimately the wall to collapse. And I think the Copyright Office may have essentially thought that the whole thing was unworthy at such a low level of creativity. After all, it's just bricks uh, 
and uh, and Ball that, that surely there's no authorship there. And uh, what uh, the the DC Circuit opinion uh, reminded the office of was this is an audiovisual work and the creativity is not simply in the components of the rectangles but in uh, the the motion elements a, a motion picture uh, and whether there's creativity in the way that the ball knocks the bricks down so without suggesting that this was citizen kane uh, nonetheless there was more locus of creativity than the Copyright Office uh, appeared willing to acknowledge in that case. Yeah, and I think there was also in the first case a gentle admonition to the Copyright Office to be a little bit more clear about their reasons for uh, denying, uh, denying registration. <laughs> and, uh, and then only in the second opinion saying, well, okay, you apply the standard, but uh, there has been a Supreme Court decision intervening, uh, the Feist case, and uh, you didn't meet uh, you didn't meet that standard, or the uh, the breakout game did meet uh, that standard. You shouldn't have rejected it. Uh, and back to the point about uh, the convoluted uh, language that Congress has given the courts in determining uh, separability in the case of, of useful useful articles. Uh, it is you know, helpful to see uh, those cases where the Congress has been crystal clear about its intentions uh, and Justice Ginsburg's uh, resp <clears throat> response to, to that clarity. If, if there's anyone out there uh, who thinks that this particular justice shaped her uh, results according to a preference for creators uh, over users or users over creators, uh, which is a game commonly played among people in, uh, in the copyright world. Are you a high protectionist or a low protectionist? Uh, I would only suggest that they compare two majority opinions uh, written by uh, Justice Ginsburg that were only uh, five years apart. Uh, the, the first was her 2014 uh, opinion in the Petrella against uh, MGM, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer case, uh, where she wrote for the court when Congress said there is a three year statute of limitations for bringing copyright actions. You've got to bring an action within, you've got to file an action within three years of when the infringement uh, occurred. Uh, it meant that. And it didn't mean that even if you brought the action within three years, but were laggard uh, for some, in, in some manner, uh, in bringing that action, the old equitable doctrine of latches, uh, L-A-C-H-E-S, uh, would prevent you from bringing the action. So when they said three years, they meant uh, three years. That was hardly a, uh, a win for users and uh, low protectioners, protectionists, uh, and it was a sure win for authors and other laggard copyright owners. Well, there's a win uh, for, for creators. Uh, by contrast, look at the 2019 opinion uh, in, that she wrote for the court, majority opinion in uh, Fourth Estate against WallStreet.com. There she held that, and this was a split among the circuits uh, in the country. Uh, when the Copyright Act requires uh, that registration of a copyright have, has been attained in the Copyright Office prior to filing a lawsuit. Uh, the division was, did you have to have a certificate in hand uh, or at least a clear rejection from the Copyright Office of your application before you could proceed? Or was it enough, uh, the so-called application approach, that you uh, submitted all of the required materials to the Copyright Office and were now just waiting for your, uh, for your certificate? 
Uh, and this was sometimes a painful decision because copyright registration can take weeks or months, more likely months, and you may be in a hurry to get an injunction, a preliminary injunction against someone who's infringing your work. Uh, nonetheless, uh, in a world in which formalities are not like registration are supposed to mean less than they did in the olden days, Justice Ginsburg read the statute uh, and said, look, there's the only way to read this statute is that Congress intended in its plain words that you have a certificate in hand before you can sue. Uh, a clear loss for for authors and uh, and copyright owners. Jane, I don't think I have much to to add to that. Uh, the the uh, outcome uh, in for the state uh, is unfortunate, given the reality of how long it can take to get a registration. Better now than it was at the time, but. Uh, I think at the time it was there was a backlog of even 18 months uh, that that is improved, but it's still not instantaneous unless you get uh, you pay for a special treatment in the 48 hour uh, regist registration, which I suppose is the short answer. But uh, institutionally, the answer is uh, Congress has to uh, give more resources to the Copyright Office so that it can register in a more timely fashion. But the court can't do that and the statute uh, is, is clear. Uh, in, uh, in the case of Petrella, there was not only the clarity of the statute, but also some common sense. Since she pointed out that if there were to be uh, a, a latches gloss on the statute of limitations, that might put authors in the position of having to sue when perhaps the wiser course would be to wait. And uh, that would not be a good set of incentives. So a, a sensible Congress wouldn't do that. Yeah, and that's you know, a point that I, I failed to, to mention uh, about the practicalities of you know, going back to the fourth state opinion. Uh, it's hard to read that opinion without seeing the message that really Congress, you ought to come in and help out on appropriations to the Copyright Office. That's where, uh, where the problem was. Done though, in the usual gentle uh, but pointed, uh, pointed manner. Uh, I'd like to turn to uh, international copyright, which uh, you are one of the country's leading experts in uh, international and comparative copyright law. And I suspect you had a uh, particular interest in cases, decisions like uh, Kurtzang and uh, Golan. Uh, and what I saw in Justice uh, Ginsburg's uh, opinion in these cases, her dissent in Kurtzang and her opinion for the majority uh, in, in Golan was a real appreciation for Congress's treaty-based obligations uh, to bring US copyright law into conformity uh, with, with international copyright norms. Uh, in, in the Kurtzang case, uh, I, I sensed where she dissented, I sensed real dismay uh, at the uh, court's interpretation of language that I thought had plain meaning in the statute, but the court's uh, interpretation of it in a way that effectively abandoned uh, assumptions, long held assumptions, not only in the United States, but around the world about the meaning of territoriality, that copyright is territorial. Uh, what happens in the United States gets governed by US law. What happens in Thailand gets governed by Thai law. Uh, and longstanding assumptions about uh, the first sale doctrine and, and exhaustion. Uh, but that may be a little bit too technical for uh, this, this discussion. So let me turn to the uh, Another example, because I'm, I'm using it also to just as an excuse for quoting from uh, a couple of paragraphs, because I just love 
Justice Ginsburg style. If, if that's not evident by now, uh, it, it will be. Uh, and this is her two, uh, 2012 uh, opinion for the majority in, in Golan against Golan against Holder uh, that Shira uh, alluded to in her her remarks. Uh, upholding restoration of copyright in foreign works uh, where the copyright had been lost because of failure to comply with US formalities or copyright term had expired. Article 18 of the Berne Convention to which the United States had more recently uh, finally uh, joined commands uh, adherence to the Berne Convention to protect such works that fell into the public domain uh, for, for these reasons. And just consider, I mean, it's easy to forget that Justice Ginsburg was also at one point a law teacher. And so apart from being a, you know, a justice of, you know, unexcelled, uh, competence. Uh, she was also a law teacher of unexcelled competence. And that comes through in, in the opinions. Just listen to uh, the, the opening paragraph of her opinion. Uh, this is a law teacher as well as a Supreme Court justice writing. And I quote, the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works, which took effect in 1886, is the principal accord governing international copyright relations. Latecomer to the international copyright regime launched by Byrne, the United States joined the convention in 1989. To perfect US implementation of Byrne and as part of our response to the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations, Congress in 1994 gave works enjoying copyright protection abroad, the same full term of protection available to US works. Uh, close, close quote. Uh, and as usual, the opinion, although international in scope, found its anchor in Congress's uh, dominating political competency. Uh, so here's the concluding paragraph of that, that opinion. Quote, Congress determined that US interests were best served by our full participation in the dominant system of international copyright protection. Those interests include ensuring exemplary compliance with our international obligations, securing greater protection for US authors abroad, and remedying unequal treatment of foreign authors. The judgment section 514 expresses lies well within the ken of the political branches. So how does an international copyright lawyer, Jane, look look at that? Uh, well, I, I, first of all, the, the, from the first paragraph, I, I think that there was some um, understatement, not to say euphemism, in saying that the Uruguay Round Amendments Act perfects our <laughs> compliance with Byrne because we were outrageously out of compliance. Uh, with respect to the restoration of copyright in uh, foreign uh, burn, burn works, uh, but highly diplomatic <laughs> to put it as protect. And I think exemplary compliance may be a bit uh, uh, optimistic given that our compliance with uh, international norms uh, is it continues to be imperfect, at least when it comes to the United States recognition and protection of moral rights, which uh, is an international obligation that just lacks the teeth that the obligation to restore copyright uh, in prematurely in the public domain works uh, enjoys by virtue of, of, the, of the TRIPS Accord. So I, I think that the, the emphasis on the importance of being a full player in the international system, which the majority opinion in Golan emphasizes a number of times, including citing the present register of copyright uh, for the importance of US compliance in US treaty negotiations. Uh, it certainly is, is a, a dominant theme 
uh, although it might be a, a bit hopeful uh, with respect to some of our compliance with international norms. Great. Uh, you know, in uh, Golan, that's one part of the Golan opinion. The other part uh, required the court to push back on arguments that it had addressed uh, years earlier, uh, our constitutional arguments based on the First Amendment and the copyright uh, clause. Uh, the argument made that uh, restoration of term violated uh, First Amendment interests and uh, the constitutional uh, notions of limited times and progress of science. She had also already traversed uh, this ground nine years earlier in uh, Justice Ginsburg's opinion for the majority in Eldred against Ashcroft, uh, which uh, I think Jane or Shearer referred to earlier, uh, validating uh, Congress's extension of copyright term uh, for, for 20 years. If, if ever there was a congressional uh, determination to tempt a justice to second guess the wisdom uh, of copyright, uh, it was the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998. Uh, and two justices of the court dissenting uh, in the Eldred case succumbed to, to that temptation. This is crazy. They said you get nothing by, uh, nothing good by extending copyright by 20 years. Uh, leaving little doubt, and this Jane is the passage you referred to uh, earlier, leaving little doubt about where her own uh, policy preferences lay. Uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote, and this is the conclusion of that opinion, uh, in sum, we find that the CTEA is a rational enactment. We are not at liberty, liberty to second guess congressional determinations and policy judgments of this order, however debatable or arguably unwise they may be. Uh, accordingly, we cannot conclude that the CTEA, which con continues the unbroken congressional practice of treating future and existing copyrights in parity for term extension purposes is an impermissible exercise of Congress's power under the copyright copyright clause. Uh, I'd just like to you know, say a, a closing, uh, or anything on that, Jane, you wanted to add, because I've had some closing uh, thoughts. Uh, I have nothing to add. OK. <laughs> Uh, just a closing word then on, on Justice, Ginsburg's, Justice Ginsburg's opinion writing style. Uh, intellectual rigor and lawyerly care mark every one uh, of these copyright opinions, but so do elegance and uh, the high practice of the, the essayist's art. I wasn't surprised uh, to read uh, that as an undergraduate at Cornell, uh, Ruth Bader studied literature uh, with Vladimir Nabokov, uh, nor that she learned from him, and here I'm quoting uh, from, uh, from her, her passage, quote, how words could paint pictures. This is what she learned from him, how words could paint pictures and that choosing the right words in the right order could make an enormous difference in conveying an image or an idea. Uh, that is a lesson in rhetoric that really is carried through all the, the opinions. Uh, I don't know, Jane, you may disagree, but I think it's a mugs game uh, to try to uh, extract from Justice Ginsburg's copyright jurisprudence, uh, an answer to the question, was she a high protectionist or a, a low protectionist, whether her decisions uh, respected authors over readers, or for that meter, matter, readers over authors. I believe that what her opinions reveal overall is a deep respect for the institution of copyright. Uh, the institution's long history, its long proven ability to connect readers to authors and authors to readers. 
my final thought. I don't think I have anything to add to that either. I, I, uh, I agree that uh, she wasn't uh, reflexively pro-author uh, or pro-user. I think she was pro-copyright as a system uh, to achieve the goals that are set out in, in the Constitution. And perhaps in that respect, uh, she and Justice Breyer might have had some difference in that I think he uh, has expressed fundamental skepticism uh, about the uh, desirability of the institution, uh, whereas I think she really believed uh, in, in copyright as a, a means to promote the progress of science. Great, couldn't agree more. Uh, Wonderful speaking with you. I think our allotted time is is up. Uh, great to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Professors Ginsburg and Goldstein, for that very insightful conversation and sharing with us the way in which Justice Ginsburg gave great care and attention to um, copyright and the copyright system. And next, I would like to invite. Betsy West, Julie Cohen, and Derek Wayne to the virtual stage. Betsy and Julie are the co-directors and co-producers of the Academy Award nominated documentary film, RBG. And Derek is the composer and librettist of the acclaimed opera, Galia Ginsburg. Betsy, Julie, and Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So, here. Yes. Um, so as we just heard from Professors Ginsburg and Goldstein, we heard about some of the very important ways in which Justice Ginsburg influenced copyright law through her legal opinions. Uh, now we want to pivot a bit and center our conversation more around her impact on creativity and on culture and more specifically to learn about how Justice Ginsburg influenced all of you to create your respective works. Um, but before we begin, I want to make a quick note to the audience that if you do have questions for Betsy, Julie, and Derek, you may enter them in the Q&A field, and I will try to work some of those questions into the conversation that we're going to have right now, uh, but just a note that we may not get to them all. Uh, so with that, I'll start off, and I'll, I'll shoot the first question to you, Derek, um, since you were one of the first in more recent years um, to usher in this sort of new wave of creative works about Justice Ginsburg and the Supreme Court in general. Uh, you could say that you were a sort of pioneer in this space. So could you share what your inspiration was, where it came from, and how you chose to focus in particular on Justices Ginsburg and Scalia? First, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here today. And thank you for these kind words. As it happens, my inspiration came specifically from Justices Ginsburg and Scalia. As a law student a decade ago, reading case after case after Supreme Court case, I was struck by three aspects of these justices. First, the conflict between their written opinions as judges, in which they often disagreed strongly. Second, the friendship between them as human beings, which transcended their ideological differences. And last but not least, their shared love of opera. And for any of my students who are watching this for extra credit, by opera, I mean a certain subset of dramatic works, including accompanying music. And with this inspiration, I thought, why not combine these three qualities of their relationship, the conflict, the friendship, and the love of opera into an opera about the two of them? And here we are today. <laughs> It's such a great uh, story and inspiration. So I wanna turn to Betsy and Julie now and sort of get some of the information about uh, your beginning inspirations. I do understand that each of you interviewed Justice Ginsburg independently uh, for different projects before coming together to make the RBG documentary film, which I think most of us have probably seen and understand that it focuses on Justice Ginsburg as a pioneering champion for women's rights, as well as her sort of newfound rock star status. Um, so did those early interviews inspire 
any of these themes or ideas included in creating the RBG documentary? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I was working on a, a video project about the modern women's movement when I learned about uh, Justice Ginsburg's role as a women's rights litigator. And so I went to Washington in 2011 and interviewed her for that project, which wound up being a short video and part of a bigger documentary. And was, of course, uh, very impressed and uh, learned a lot about both her jurisprudence, her impact on American women, and also the great love story uh, with her husband, Marty. Uh, and then Julie uh, also interviewed Justice Ginsburg, what, a couple of years later, I guess. That's right. I interviewed Justice Ginsburg in 2013 for a film called The Sturgeon Queens about a Lower East Side smoked fish store that the justice um, was a big fan of. So we were aware that Justice Ginsburg was an extraordinary presence on camera and also through Betsy's work of uh, the, the amazing uh, life story and early career story that matched uh, a Supreme Court career. But it was really, uh, honestly, I'd say some other copyrighted work since we're in, in that frame of mind, such as Derek's opera yes. and, um, you know, and the sort of growing field of uh, fair use, use of Justice Ginsburg's image to create all of these uh, crazy internet memes and even rap songs that had been rewritten to work uh, Justice Ginsburg's name into their, into their lyrics. And just the, the fascination that it seemed that she as a character was starting to hold for young people, um, I'd say young women in particular, uh, young women law students uh, qu quite, quite specifically, but the, the whole thought of a Supreme Court justice becoming a pop culture icon really opened a door for us to be able to make a documentary about the very serious and important you know, ideals that Justice Ginsburg had spent her life as a lawyer and as a judge pursuing, but that ordinarily it would be a little bit hard to pitch, you know, to people that fund movies in the world, like, oh, we want to make a big documentary about, you know, equal protection clause jurisprudence and how this can be used for women's rights. Like, that, that's, that's not sort of a pitch, but if you can say, like, look at this, you know, this, this person who's become a superstar, um, and that everyone's so fascinated by, and then we're gonna go back and, and tell that story. And that's kind of how we came to make the film. Thanks for sharing that. It sounds sound like there were lots of um, Justice Ginsburg uh, inspirations coming from lots of different places, not only from your interviews uh, yourself that you have with her, but also from things that you had seen and gathered and taken in. And I guess I'll, that'll bring me back to Derek. You even mentioned um, Derek, so Derek, with you having created, um, you know, your the Scalia Ginsburg opera, um, how how soon after that work premiered and began to um, be circulated, did you sort of see an increase in the interest in Justice Ginsburg and people creating uh, works about her life and related to her life? And do you feel that you had a role, even after Julie told you you did? But <laughs> do you feel that you had a role in um, inspiring some of those works? First of all, thank you to Julie and Betsy uh, for, for that very kind shout out. Um, it's very nice to know. And yes, if we're talking, I suppose, of what future sociologists will refer to as the Bader Ginsburg effect. And when I started working on this opera a decade ago and told people about it, they would say things like, you're writing about what? Or who would come to watch that? And they were skeptical, to put it mildly. But we have to remember, of course, that the level of public interest in the Supreme Court was not as high. There weren't as many Supreme Court justice themed books or movies or blogs or memes or t-shirts or tattoos as there are now. But in June, 2013, I was lucky enough to present some of my work at the Supreme Court at Justice Ginsburg's kind invitation. And as news of the opera and this presentation spread around the country, so did interest in our nation's highest court. And now, in a world where we're all more educated about Justice Ginsburg's impact in our democracy, 
I can only hope that I played some role in making this happen. Yeah, I, I could jump in here on this. I think also in 2013 and 2014 was when Justice Ginsburg was writing some very uh, sh strong dissents to uh, decisions that the Supreme Court was issuing uh, as it was turning toward the right. And that in turn inspired many of the meme makers uh, who started to spread the word about Notorious RBG, the blogger who started that blog, that ultimately became a book. It actually, you know, we knew about the blog, we knew about the uh, all of the internet memes, but as we were making our film, then the Notorious RBG book came out and, you know, it was, it was escalating at that time. Yeah, lo lots of, lots of material um, all around. <laughs> Um, so I want to pivot a little bit and Julie and Betsy ask you a question about um, the intention sort of in who you involved in creating um, the documentary. So in creating your work, you definitely worked with a team of women in executive roles and in creative roles. And was this an intentional decision um, for you all? And if so, was this influenced by Justice Ginsburg's effort for gender equality and women's rights? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Justice Ginsburg sort of inspired every facet of our film from its subject matter to our process and putting it together and sort of the incremental one step at a time style that was hers and even down to the thought of, um, you know, here we were two women making a film about a woman who had devoted her whole life to moving forward the position of women in society. So why not try to bring together a team where the key creatives were women? And then as it happened, I mean, we would have, we would have taken a uh, executive funding partnership really with, I think anyone who was a good partner willing to, to take participate, but I think it's not a coincidence that it was a, a group of the, the, the three women that run CNN films that immediately saw this as a potential, uh, you know, great movie idea. Great. And Derek, I want to talk, turn to you a little bit too, in terms of like, um, sort of empowering women, if you will, um, through your opera in Scalia and Ginsburg. And one thing I thought that was really interesting, I recently saw an interview um, with you where you noted that you use the musical theme from Fanny Mendelssohn, who was a lesser known um, sister of the famous composer Felix Mendelssohn. And she had essentially been told she can't have a career or couldn't have a career as a composer because she was a woman. And you explained that you did this, um, use the theme in a nod to and sort of in comparison with some of the challenges that Justice Ginsburg faced as a woman in law. So how did you learn about these types of parallels and were there other areas that you incorporated this sort of um, parallel and nod to uh, women uh, in honor of Justice Ginsburg in Scalia Ginsburg Opera. Yes, so thank you. You've just very, very clearly articulated the, I guess, undiscovered relationship between composer Felix Mendelssohn and Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. And in both cases, there were men named Felix who told very talented women in their sphere that they were perhaps could not, weren't cut out for a professional life because of their gender. And this was one example, there are many others, um, of parallels between music and law that I was fascinated by. So yes, to the point of parallels between music and law, well, I was lucky enough to learn quite a bit of music history at Harvard and Yale, and then was fortunate enough to study law at the University of Maryland. And in that process, I couldn't help but draw parallels between music and law and something I continue to do to this day. And as a result, the script or libretto for the Scalia Ginsburg opera has over 200 footnotes to musical and legal references. Now to your question specifically about women's issues, I thought using the traditions of opera and then playing around with them, maybe subverting them a little bit was, would be an interesting way to comment on the role of 
women in law, women in opera, and how society views gender generally. Justice Ginsburg is famous for having, for being an opera fan, but also of having said that opera is not necessarily sort of the best example of feminism at work because of the plots in which there are many heroines who are trapped by society. And so we see what kind of unhelpful, corrosive effect of the society in which they find themselves. But often in the stories, they don't, they aren't given all the agency that they perhaps deserve. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have an opera where actually the lead male figure, you know, not to spoil too much of the plot, where the lead male figure finds himself sort of trapped and in trouble, and it's the lead female who comes to the rescue. Now, this has happened a few times, you know, for example, in Beethoven's Fidelio, but it's not necessarily the norm. And so I thought it would be interesting to have that as part of the plot. And then as far as specific parallels between music and law, one that doesn't show up in the footnotes, but is interesting, is that in Justice Ginsburg's first big aria or song called You Are Searching in Vain for a Bright Line Solution, she's articulating her view of the Constitution. And although it's not explicitly stated in the text of this song, what I thought would be interesting to do would to have, would to be, sorry, what I thought would be interesting to do was have a lovely melody for the Justice Ginsburg character that proceeded stepwise, meaning in a scale. So if you'll pardon my singing voice, you are searching in vain for a bright line solution. And the idea there throughout that song is to give the audience maybe an unconscious sense that there's an incremental step-by-step -step way in which the character gets from the beginning to the end and eventually to the very thrilling you know, high notes in the score. And that is one example of an interaction between music and law as it um, affects the sort of the issues that Justice Ginsburg faced as a woman. Um, not to go on too much, I would say that for those of you who are interested in exploring more, I'd suggest checking out the Columbia Journal of Law and the Arts, winter 2015 edition, which published an early version of this libretto or script. Uh, the show has been revised since then. And when that script is published, I'll uh, be happy to let you know. But I think the Columbia Journal of Law and the Arts will provide, the, uh, provide a lot of um, references to more of these kinds of issues for those of you who are interested. And incidentally, it did justify all those hours I spent in the Law Journal Library learning how to pull and cite footnotes. So I am grateful for that as well. Thank you for sharing those connections and how you built on those themes. And, um, and now it actually brings me a question that I have for all of you all. Um, and it's sort of connected to what you were just talking about, Derek, but it's how you sort of included um, or chose what material to include in your respective works. So um, we at the Copyright Office recently just published a blog about works entering the public domain. Uh, for people in the audience who may not be aware, public domain is basically just a term that we use to describe material that is not protected by copyright. It can include material that expired uh, protection or material that was never protected, um, some material that was never protected, being works of the federal government, uh, for example, and also some judicial opinions of judges and um, some legislative, uh, legislative laws. So with that material being available to you and all this material in the public domain, the government works, much of which was generated by um, Justice Ginsburg, the public domain material, Derek, you just mentioned some of the composers and things like scales and things that you used and themes that you developed. How did having all of this public domain material influence how you chose to create your particular uh, work? Well, I think one way that uh, public domain material came into major play and how we made RBG was the existence of audio recorded Supreme Court arguments, which are indeed in the public domain and happen to have started 
um, really just a few years before Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a lawyer became, began making arguments to the Supreme Court. And the fact that the six arguments that she had made um, for the court in the 1970s were all on audio tape and were all public domain works was a really central you know, was and not to mention some of the later, you know, decisions and dissents that she that she wrote and read parts of from the bench uh, in, in later years. Like that audio tape was very much a central theme uh, throughout our film. Of course, as filmmakers, which is not only an audio but also a visual medium, it creates the challenge for like, okay, well now we have what you're hearing, but what are you gonna be seeing in those moments? And often the marriage of different visuals to the audio is part of how you're creating a, a creative work out of uh, two, two, disparate, uh, two disparate pieces. But I, I mean, I, I feel like that, that public domain material existence was probably central to our being able to tell, to tell our story. Yeah, I mean, we also had to rely on licensed material, a lot of licensed material, and also some material which uh, we used as fair use with the advice of a lawyer. <laughs> well, I love this question because in my class, I usually don't get to talk too much about 17 USC 105. So the idea that works by members of the federal government in the course of their employment are in the public domain, that fact may not necessarily be of interest to you know, every creator in the world, but certainly it was something that really inspired me. And the combination between the opinions of Supreme Court justices being in the public domain, plus the rich history of uh, opera, much of which is in the public domain, those two big influences made it possible for me to write an opera that refers to a lot of traditional operas and their styles, and also refers to statements and opinions of the justices, such that almost every stanza or every moment in the, in the opera is actually in conversation with these rich traditions. I would also, like to say that I'm thankful um, to, for the audio recordings as well that Julie mentioned, because sometimes we find ourselves in a place where, well, how is the singer supposed to pronounce the name of this case or this, you know, the name of this party? <laughs> and luckily, you know, we go and we find a nice public domain recording um, and we can hear exactly how Justice Ginsburg said the name in the courtroom uh, on, the, on that particular day. So I, I want to turn, we did get a question um, from the audience um, that I'll share with you all. And they ask, why do you think Justice Ginsburg so lovingly embraced the meme and the celebrity? Uh, and you all, um, I know Julie met her in your interview and Derek, um, she was definitely a fan of uh, your opera. So I think you all might be positioned to give an opinion here. Yes, I, you know, uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, did not use Twitter herself and she wasn't a meme maker. And I think at the very beginning of her um, uh, popularity on social media, uh, it had to be explained to her by her clerks what these things were, uh, but she came to, I, I believe get quite a kick out of Notorious RBG. She saw the joke in it and she understood um, that perhaps uh, this kind of, of um, exposure to a different generation, to a different public was going to allow a greater exposure of the ideas that she believed in. Uh, so she carried often with her a little tote bag that said, I dissent, you know, it was one of the, it was one of the memes and, and she really uh, did uh, enjoy it. I think some of what came out in the conversation earlier about Justice Ginsburg's love for art very generally play, plays a role too. I mean, we went into our project understanding 
that RBG was an opera lover. We didn't understand how much she was devoted to like almost every kind of art very broadly from, you know, from books and short stories to uh, we went with her to a textile museum to, you know, to textiles from different cultures to independent film, both documentary and film. We were, I mean, we work with a lot of different subjects and often the more important someone is, the more likely they will be to try to think that they should have a creative imprint on what your film should be. Um, Justice Ginsburg was just the opposite. She really um, had respect for the whole idea of the filmmaking projects and uh, the pro process and that we were the documentary filmmakers and she was gonna trust us to come up with a way to tell her story as, as we saw fit in a way that that's, seemed quite unusual for someone of, of her stature. Yeah, I mean, Justice Ginsburg did not see the film until she sat down in an audience of 500 people at uh, the Sundance Film Festival and watched it there which <laughs> was nerve wracking for us. But um, I think that uh, as Julie said, she, she understood that this was our job and she, she trusted us to do it and she was gonna see what, what we came up with. Well, for my part, uh, I don't know if I can speak to uh, all the meme making, but certainly I was delighted by the fact that she, Justice Ginsburg, seemed very happy about the idea of an opera being written about her and her work. And I like to think that part of it had to do with the research. I did, you know, I did send her some material and then of course ended up presenting at the Supreme Court and that material was duly footnoted. And I could tell that she had read the footnotes because sometimes she would ask me questions <laughs> about the footnotes. And I thought, how lucky I am to be writing about someone so accomplished and impactful and for them to take such an interest in my work. And then to Julie, to your point, in that same way where although she took an interest in the work, she seemed you know, very much to realize that it was the work of a creator and that she wasn't going to try to you know, uh, put her own imprint on it or anything like that. And so the combination of all those factors just made the creative process very fulfilling. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, each of you have created works that are inspired by Justice Ginsburg's life. Um, but you've done so in different mediums, one in an opera, one in a documentary film. And there we've heard today about all the other types of creative works that are inspired by her life, um, books, articles, drawings, even action figures. Why do you think it's important that we um, have these various types of creative forms to tell these types of stories about and bring awareness um, about people like, excuse me, bring awareness to, um, the world about four people like Justice Ginsburg. I think it's for exactly so refer, okay. in exactly the way that it's played out. I mean, different, you know, you've got different groups of people are absorbing their news in different ways. Uh, very few people are reading the actual words of Supreme Court opinions uh, and, and dissents. Um, you know, a slightly larger uh, segment are getting some journalistic sense of this, but once you're in a situation where people can be absorbing their information from, you know, uh, an Instagram meme, from anywhere from an Instagram meme to a tattoo, to an, uh, you know, a, a, a beautifully done, more classical opera, to you know, a macrame vision of someone's face that also would have a quote that they say. It's just like, it, it, it's actually a way to spread information and creatively presented information in all these different mediums. It, it, it actually, I, I think, I feel like it couldn't really have worked better to spread messages of issues like equal justice under law um, had had RBG planned it out herself, which I, I hazard to guess she actually did not. Um. 
I guess for my part, I am grateful for the fact that the Scalia Ginsburg opera has brought people together. And it is a little bit unfashionable, I suppose, to talk about art as a means for education. I think we see in the world of the creative arts that works that have an educational component sometimes find themselves placed in a category where, well, it's more about the education and it's not really truly art or something, you know, perhaps some, that's something that documentarians sometimes feel. And so I felt so lucky that rather than this opera sort of being just, you know, the sort of school assembly thing that one does out of a sense of obligation, which is incidentally to say nothing against school assemblies, which have been very great in my artistic development. But the idea that a work, a creative work, oh, an original work of authorship, I suppose I should say, um, can be treated both as an artistic work, but also as a way of communicating ideas and openly in that way, I think has been very gratifying. And so for the opera, what we've found is that different kinds of audiences find themselves coming together. At the beginning, I think it was a lot of hardcore Supreme Court followers, um, especially in the legal field, but then also opera aficionados. And while there certainly is some overlap between lawyers and opera aficionados, it's not, you know, it's not um, a coterminous a relationship. And so you had these music fans and these law followers coming together. Sometimes I guess there would be CLE involved. So, uh, and then as Justice Ginsburg's reputation became more well-known, I think the opera became a way for people more generally to come and grapple with the idea of what it means to see the humanity in someone who disagrees with you. Yeah. And so I think the, I, the idea that there are different forms in which this can happen, it can be through an opera, it can be through a documentary, it can be in some other form. Um, however it happens, I'm just glad that it is happening. Yeah, I, I, to add to that, you know, Justice Ginsburg was a great subject. Her life was about so many important things. And to be in a theater with an audience of many different generations who were responding to the story and to the themes, uh, whether they were the legal themes of um, equality under the law or as, as you talk about, Derek, a friendship across political <laughs> divide, the importance of civil discourse, um, the importance of, of you know, how, to, uh, how to face setbacks, uh, how, to have, how to overcome struggles, your, your strategy in, in getting to where you want to go. So many, so many themes in a film uh, that Justice Ginsburg's life embodied. And it was for us, wonderful to see that, you know, it was not only older generations of women who were responding to this, it were men who were happy to see Marty Ginsburg as a hero. It was the millennial generation. And then we had an awful lot of, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old girls who would show up in the audience wearing their RBG outfits with their glasses and carrying a gavel. And they had such enthusiasm for for this, uh, for this woman and, and that she was very inspirational. Um, thank you for that. And in all of your answers, um, you sort of, I, I saw a theme of just many, many different types of audiences um, sort of being brought together um, through this common interest and this common um, good that was in Justice Ginsburg. And that brings me actually back to something that came out of your opera, Derek. Um, you developed the theme, the saying, um, the slogan, if you will, we are different, we are one. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that means and how it relates to Justice Ginsburg? Certainly. 
for the final portion of the opera, Scalia Ginsburg, I was writing a duet to be sung by the characters of the two justices. For those of you who don't know, the opera is a comedy about this unlikely friendship between these two figures who are leading judges and who disagree quite a bit, um, but who somehow manage to make a friendship work between the two of them. And so it seemed natural that the climactic point of the opera would have something to do with this friendship. And so for this duet, I had already incorporated lines directly inspired by Justice Ginsburg's statements. For example, that dissents speak to a future age and that she revered the constitution and the court. But this song also needed a motto, a few short words that could sum up not only the relationship between her and Justice Scalia as colleagues and friends, but also the relationship between all of us as fellow Americans. And so rather than quote either justice directly, I thought over their relationship as a whole or what judges might call the totality of the circumstances. And then I wrote the phrase, we are different, we are one. And then speaking as someone who was inspired by Justice Ginsburg, I was delighted and honored when Justice Ginsburg herself started quoting these words of mine in her own speeches. <laughs> That, that's amazing. Um, so we just have a little bit more time. So I have a couple more questions. Um, in addition to you all being creators in your own right, you are all professors as well. And you all teach students in respective art forms. How has creating a work about Justice Ginsburg informed how and what you teach your students about finding inspiration in creating their own work? I mean, I think you're always wanting students to make the unusual connections between a narrow subject matter and broader, you know, the broader world and issues that are going to connect with all kinds of viewers, even if they haven't had the direct experiences that the subject of the film has, has had. And I guess in that vein, I might try to connect uh, you know, J Justice Ginsburg, larger like we, we had to back to the subject of, of copyright law, which brought so many here in the first place. We had sort of joked when we were invited to this panel, like, you know, we don't know that much about Justice Ginsburg's uh, copyright jurisprudence because that's not something that we looked into for the film because how could we have connected that narrow subject line to our broader themes? But hearing uh, in the earlier discussion, the, the uh, discussion of, Justice Ginsburg recognizing in 1992 that Atari video games were a creative work deserving of copyright protection, an idea that might have seemed radical at that time, but 10 years later was going to be really, I think, pretty obvious to almost all in our society. So, so fits in with just Justice Ginsburg's larger character attribute of being way ahead of the curve and taking an idea that seemed nuts at the time and really just Stick, sticking to it until the whole world came to see that she was right. Um, so I guess you can, you know, that, that, that lesson can go for any kind of work. You know, something very narrow can actually be part of something broader and relatable and very important. Yeah, I think more and, and more generally being able to tell um, a story with important themes through the character of one person. People like to see uh, and to hear stories about human beings and, um, and to focus on uh, Justice Ginsburg, her entire life story, her challenge as a young woman, her you know, love story with Marty uh, and the amazing jurisprudence in the 70s and and then her work as a justice all these things through her story they tell a bigger important story but they're all fo focused on one person and and i think you know that's one way certainly uh to to do a documentary and to come up with a compelling narrative i never thought before writing this opera 
that I was going to write an opera about Supreme Court justices. I don't know whether anyone thought that they were going to write an opera about Supreme Court justices. And so the reception of this work and the recognition of Justice Ginsburg's accomplishments more generally has given me a kind of assurance and has strongly influenced, I think, the future of the work that I want to create, which is to say that just because it's not a topic that everyone would immediately think of and or at the time would immediately say, wow, I would definitely, you know, see this, doesn't mean that it's not a rich subject for exploration. And I hope my students will, from the example of Justice Ginsburg, also feel that assurance to write about, to create about the things that move them, not the things that they feel that they're supposed to like or that they're supposed to create. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that it's, it's influenced me as well is because it, is, it has changed, in fact, some of the future work that is different from what I thought I was going to be doing. And now I realize through the experience of learning so much about Justice Ginsburg that all of these materials, archival, historical, that may seem obscure on the surface can really be a rewarding source for I think a lot of impactful art. And so if there's anything I've learned from this journey, it's the importance of unlocking value in unlikely places. Thanks for that, um, Derek. And we've reached the end of our time, but I would like to offer you all any final remarks that you would like to leave with our audience about your works or about Justice Ginsburg, um, if you wanna take that opportunity. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I could say that uh, Justice Ginsburg also led us in a direction that we might not have anticipated and that um, uh, our next film is about a legal pioneer named Polly Murray, who Justice Ginsburg credited in the first uh, brief that she wrote as a, uh, a litigator for gender equality. And uh, that opened a whole door for us, uh, a brand new, a brand new area. So um, thank you, Justice Ginsburg for that. You're here. Just to say thank you again to all of you for allowing me to be a part of this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us and a special thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their time, their talents, their expertise, and for those joining from Derek's class, there is a code word. It is opera. Um, for everyone, we hope to see you at the next event. We hope that you leave today feeling inspired and having a great day. Thank you all.